Welcome back to the Solid Verbal Boys and Girls. My name is Ty Hildenbrand. Joining me as always, the man with the plan, the heart of the Midwest. Yes, I said it. He is the heart of the Midwest. Sure. Living in the heart of the Midwest. Dan Rubenstein, sir. Welcome back to the pod. How goes it? Good. I just finished an entire, you know, some people call it a casserole. Some people call it a hot dish. Mm. I don't know what you grew up. I, call, I don't know what I grew up calling it, but uh, I just finished three of those to prove my Midwestern medal. Uh, as we talk about college football in March, it's flurrying outside as we speak, Ty, but that's not going to stop us from going through a flurry of news and opinions about the four team era of the yeah. college football playoff, a bygone era, dramatically so. Hey, sorry for the quick interruption, but it'd be incredible if you considered subscribing to the Solid Verbal YouTube channel right down below. A bygone era, indeed. We will get into that in just a few minutes. What? All of that entails and, and why it is a bygone era. It's now yeah. two eras ago, if we're being proper about it, because True. college football playoff decided it was going to expand to 14, which we have not talked about. We'll talk about it on this episode. This is after they just got to 12 and after they just decided to go to 12 from four. We haven't even started the 12 team yet. No. Ready going to 14. So we'll get into that and much, much more. And as you alluded, yes, we're going to get into some of the bygones that were in the four-team college football era. Some of our shining moments from said four-team era as we took a walk down memory lane. You came up with the idea for this episode, and I think we both arrived at the same conclusion, albeit maybe through different ways. There was a lot more legwork that went into this episode <laughs> than initially <laughs> thought. <laughs> I cannot tell you how many instances of getting the year wrong I will. I'm setting the uh, the over under right now at 11 and a half instances. Be like, well, it was the 2019 LSU team, but it was the 2020 college football playoff. So I don't know. I'm I'm gonna mess it up, and it's okay. All I do, all I would, all I would ask for is from you some grace, Ty, as I mess of all of this up. Uh, and from anybody listening, just correct me. And do it like in a like a pretty chill way, uh, whether it's solverable at gmail.com or if you just want to say, yeah, I think you were wrong about this. It was definitely TCU here um, or it was definitely Georgia there. Uh, solverable at gmail.com or anywhere. I don't know. Twitter, Instagram, uh, whatever floats your boat. I would encourage our listeners out on YouTube. YouTube is a good call to be as vicious as possible on Dan. Just tear <laughs> him Limb from limb, you don't do your research. You don't care about the sanctity of the year 2020. Right, right, right. Just rip him limb you can, from limb. You can do say that whatever. for me. Yeah. Well, you can. Okay, so what you can do is any take I have, anything I'm wrong about, be vocal about, be assertive about. But all I ask is that there's a preamble that begins with, well, yes, I admit Dan is exceedingly handsome. He really <laughs> did screw up his 2015 Ohio State take. All That's right. all. Get I want the preamble. That's all I ask. Get creative with it, whether it's, as you said, solidverbal at gmail.com, mm -hmm. across social media, out on YouTube, wherever it is you consume the pod. We, we appreciate that. Uh, two bits of housekeeping real quick. Yeah, what do you have? We are, we are pushing all the chips in the middle here in the offseason throughout the course of 2024. It's going to be a big year in college football. And so we'd encourage folks who are just passing on through the most important thing you can do to support the podcast. Yeah. Whatever app you are listening to this very podcast episode on, hit the follow button. Hit the follow button. That's the most important thing you can do to help. I was going to say Venmo you five hundred dollars. Well, that doesn't hurt. <laughs> hit the follow button. We appreciate yeah. it. That's the most important thing you can do to support the podcast. Secondly, if you consider yourself a super verballer, go to verballers.com. That yeah, is our that'd be Patreon. Cool. That's where you get this episode. A little bit early, you get ad-free episodes, you get access to all the games we do in the offseason. We started a bracket pool right now for our folks out on verballers.com. You also get access to the Discord, bonus perks that go a long way in helping support Dan and I a little bit further, verballers.com. Yeah, that's it. Without further ado. Going to save my voice for the season, Dan. It's not so much breaking at this point. We're recording this. On Monday, March the 18th, many of you will listen to this on the 19th. And oh, by the way, as we travel back in time to March the 15th, it became official that they were going to 14 in the college football playoff. 
Um, this had followed a few weeks worth of rumors. It started with, yeah, they're just they're just kind of kicking the tires on this. Maybe we go to 14. It'd be a little bit more like the NFL. You guys like the NFL, right? Before you know it, then we were talking about, well, maybe the Big Ten and the SEC might get an unequal share of the pie because they're the two head honchos now in this new world order of college football. Then we saw some rumors about, wow, maybe they'll be guaranteed a certain number of teams. And we didn't like that at all. We talked about that a little bit on the show. But as luck would have it, on Friday, March the 15th, it became official that, are, that they're at least expanding to 14. They're expanding to 14 starting in 2026. Included in that agreement is what should be considered unequal revenue sharing with the Big Ten and the SEC getting a larger slice of the pie. I don't know if it is egregiously so. We can get into that in a little bit. We also don't know exactly what the format of that is going to be. They sort of punted on who is getting into this tournament, who those 14 teams will be. We know it's going to be, obviously, the Power Four conference champions. There'll be a group of five representative as well. But the other nine teams, we don't know exactly what that format's going to look like right. at present. They'll get into that, I guess, when they decide they want to. But as it stands, we've got 12 teams for the next two years. Then we go to 14 teams starting in 2026 and beyond Dan Rubenstein. Yeah, it look the it, it smacks of, and I hate this phrase, and I've used this phrase to talk about the expanded playoff, but the idea of a participation trophy, that there are going to be programs that have a reputation. One of the first I thought about was UCLA, right? UCLA has never really broken through. They haven't been to a Rose Bowl in decades. Um, and they're just sort of this program that exists to win, but not on any sort of impressive or notable level. And suddenly a nine and three UCLA team is very much in the running <laughs> for, especially now that they'd be in the big 10 for a college football playoff selection. So all of a sudden teams that were not able to tick boxes all of a sudden through no new real effort of their own. Like right. we're even talking about teams. If you look at years past that, like flirting with four losses now being a playoff team, I looked and I was about to sort of, make fun of I think it was it was either 2016 or 2017 Stanford that finished 13th in the country so typically we're going to see what the top 13 power 5 schools make this with likely a single G5 school representing in that you know fifth conference champion spot so the number 13 team from let's call it 2017 was Stanford at 9 and 4 okay mm. And I was about to make fun of them, but then I looked to see who was on that team and whether it would make my playoff experience more enjoyable. Christian McCaffrey? Christian Not McCaffrey? Christian, I don't believe it was Christian McCaffrey. I think that was a Bryce Love Stanford squad. But who was the leading receiver on that team? A one JJ Arthago Whiteside. Get it out. Spit it out. I got to clean my microphone. So. I can't be super angry about that. The opportunity to keep saying his name in the postseason in an alternate universe. But yeah, look, we're it's being watered down. You can't in good conscience say like, oh, we are truly doing everything we can. We're un, you know, turning over every stone to find a national champion in letting in nine and four Stanford with JJR Fago Whiteside. But on the other hand, if you're into college football like we are, it's more games. It's more opportunity for weirdness. On this show specifically, we're going to talk about performances and moments. And so the total number of games that could give us interesting, memorable performances or moments does increase. But it's hard to say that this is in place so we can do everything we can to find a national champion because... There's a point in the rankings where you're like, we're not actually having a national championship conversation, are we, in well, this moment? Okay. So I you know where I stand in the playoff. Yeah. I have said this a million times over. I apologize to our ever ballers who are tired of hearing me say it. Yeah. The four team format was always dumb. It was always dumb. I always wanted more because there were more power conferences. They should have done it. They didn't. We dealt with that for 10 years. Right. Now we're going to 12. I'm a big fan of 12. Love 12. Okay. The 14 team discussion to me does start to teeter on the brink of being excessive. Right. In my opinion. I don't so much mind that they're taking away two of the buys and they're adding two games 
on college campuses as part of this. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that's what they're doing. Now, they haven't said that, but I'm assuming that will be the way that this things go. This, the way that this thing goes, there'll be two fewer teams with buys. Those games will be on campus. I'm all about putting as many of these games on campus as possible. I couldn't give a rip about the Bulls. I don't care. I care right. about the Rose Bowl. They should just play the national championship, the Rose Bowl every year. That'd be great. But otherwise, let's play these games on campus. That's where college football is meant to be played. What really starts to skeeve me out a little bit, though, is this unequal revenue sharing thing. So yeah, like SEC, part of the reason... Well, who's running the playoff? It's not the playoff committee anymore. SEC I get Big it. 10. Yeah, I get it. They're, they're, the, they're the two with the most weight, the biggest brands, the most money, and they're going to throw their weight around. They're going to propose... You know, I, I made a video about how some of their proposals to try and get more of their teams in was a little bit shady. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit shady in that there's unequal revenue sharing. Right. The reason that they forced this through in the manner that they did is because they're also trying to time it up with what is estimated to be a $1.3 billion annual agreement between the college football playoff and ESPN. That's a lot of potatoes. Dan. Yeah, it is. One more thing, that's a lot of, a lot of potatoes. Tostitos. Yeah. It starts to really worry me, though, once we get into this territory of unequal revenue sharing. I understand why the Big Ten and the SEC would ask for it. Of course. I don't fault them. I don't fault Tony Petiti, Greg Sankey. They are representatives for their member institutions. I don't fault them at all for trying to get as big a slice of the pie as they possibly can. That's what their job is to do. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about, well, every Big Ten and SEC school is going to get $21 million per year. Meanwhile, in the SEC, those teams are only going to get $13 million. Right. Notre Dame's going to get $12 million. If you're a group of five team, you're going to get $1.8 million. If you're Oregon State and Washington State, you're going to get three hundred and sixty grand. And, and, <laughs> I believe a case of granola bars. I and believe a case of granola bars, yeah. They're the good stuff, by the way. Not right. like cheap generic granola bars. Some they're getting bars. chewy. Not yeah. a sponsor could be. Yeah, yeah, of course. When we, start, when we start codifying what has been the case in college football for an eternity, which has been the source of much of the debate in college football since eternity, this haves versus have-nots thing. When you write that into law, that starts to make me go, hmm, hmm. Like, it's kind of always been that way. Yeah. But when we start actually putting it into concrete, into stone. Yeah. Look, it's then I start, my, 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 my heart sinks a little bit that we're making this a reality that is built into the letter of the law. And it's not just something that we could talk about with a wink and a nod anymore. Now this is official. This is the lay of the land as the Big Ten and the SEC see fit. I mean, these that are what bothers me a little bit. These are this is what you wanted. This is what you and the tie heads wanted. This is not wanted. what I wanted. This is not what you I wanted. You wanted expansion, expansion, call these conference champions. We've got all these conferences. I want 12. I want 14. I want 16. If you want a true hey, player. Hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. You were, si want you were Mr. 16 before. I was Mr. 16. How can you be anti-14 but pro-16? Because of this. Because of the unequal revenue sharing. I was pro-16 yeah. with the old Dan Wetzel model. Okay. We know this. Where we include all the conference champions and maybe it doesn't have quite the, the, the luster, the star power that this 14 team version is going to have. Sure. But at least it's fair. If we're all playing under the same umbrella, everybody should be part of the same playoff. Yeah. That makes that seem like it's a logical just conclusion. You're, but that doesn't exist in reality. You're not living in reality because you know that low-level G5 games were not playing the exact same game as higher-level Power 5 teams. But just don't lump me into being like a network guy like you did with the State of the Union address. <laughs> don't do that because you know that's not true. This is not what I wanted. What would, I didn't what want... Would, if you were like very much a Thai fan on this show, you're like, <laughs> I only listen to this show for Thai. Like, what do you call you? Are you a Thai... Like, Tie in the, the the typhoons. Like what Typhoon. is? It's pretty good, right? Um, it's not bad. What is your grouping of followers that you're just like, man? I ride for tie, and that's why I'm here. Ride or tie? Yeah, it's not bad. Okay, continue. I would like to know what the Dan's are. Please write in. Let us know what these what these mm. two warring factions are <laughs> among the Verballer hood. But you get my point. My point was not that if we're going to expand to sixteen, it's going to mean more of the power teams. It I think it should mean more of the conference champions if we're going to play these conference championship games if they want the conference affiliation to mean something and the championship 
to mean something, then we sure. should include all those teams. But fine. That's not reality. Mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily pro this, giving the Big Ten and the SEC and, you know, however many teams they want. Right. And I'm certainly not, I'm certainly not pro conference realignment to the extent that we saw because I don't want to kill off the Pac-12 either. Right. But you're right. This is now the reality that we live in. I guess we're going to be forced to eat this and enjoy it. And mm -hmm. look, when push comes to shove, it will be great football to watch. Yeah. Like it'll It'll be I fun hope. to watch I fun hope. to watch more meaningful games on campus into December. I you know, like we could talk about this now, but when the rubber meets the road and we see these games, people are gonna tune into the podcast. I hope. I hope to find out more about these matchups. We already have be, meaningful games, Ty. They'll we have all them be already. Very, not on December the twentieth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I mean That'll change. There's 12 That'll change to this 13 year. existing meaningful games on the schedule for everybody. So that's important. Um, yeah, it it's the Big Ten and the SEC throwing their weight around. They want more teams participating. They feel like they're paying for this because they're, they're major teams. Their headline teams are the ones that draw everything, draw the numbers on TV and Notre Dame, of course. Um, which is why Notre Dame has a special seat at this table, understandably so. Um, but because this is a TV product and because the Big Ten and SEC are bringing the most important actors to this, they feel like they should have a say as to how many of their actors are cast <laughs> on the show. And it's no different than, look, if your mom were a billionaire and she bought the Yankees and she said, business as usual, except... Ty is starting at shortstop, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's where we are with Tony Petiti and Greg Sankey, like postseason, playoff, TV deal. Also, five of our teams are playing in this thing no matter what, right? Yeah. That's yeah. where we are, where we, it, there is like the Nepo baby quotient to this whole conversation with the Big Ten and SEC. And... I saw there was an anonymous quote. I believe it was Heather Dinich who wrote the article for ESPN where it was like the Godfather offer. You can't refuse it because this is what's laid in front of you. And this is as good as it's going to get for, you know, G5 conferences or independence, Notre Dame, whatever. So yeah, yeah. an offer they couldn't refuse. I, this is where we are. And it would be stupid for me to make any sort of uh, analogy, metaphor, whatever, beyond the thought of, 42 year old Ty playing shortstop for a random Yankee game in Baltimore in mid June, which is great. Um, it's where we are. Let's try to see the positive of it. We don't necessarily, I think we're in agreement that we're not positive who this is for beyond ESPN and potentially anybody they subcontract this out to. Uh, this is inventory and this the big inventory. 10 and SEC. This is inventory for ESPN, right? And this is another bite at the apple for the Big Ten and the SEC because it's clear that they're driving the bus at this point, right? You know, and and frankly, if you are the Big Twelve, if you are the ACC, if you are a Group of Five, if you are seeing the tenor of this conversation go in the direction of fourteen, mm -hmm. it means more money for you guys, and it also means again potentially two more slots that one of your teams could fill. Not that they will. Again, we don't know what the format is for these other. Right. nine slots so i if that is the way the conversation's going i don't think these guys are going to going to disagree with it i i do think that the real source of tension here is the big 10 and the sec versus the rest of the sport right and you know we'll just have to see how that thing shakes out by the time they decide what this format is going to be and I, and the the new precedent where it's just be as aggressive as you possibly can be in adding new teams to your conference and if you're successful you gain even more leverage over what's supposed yeah. to be like a big, neutral, national, rational, sensical postseason. And no. you don't. That that just doesn't exist in at least in name anyway. And it's just it's a bummer. It is a bummer yeah. that you can that's that's the new path to power in the sport. Or maybe it always was the power. We just never had an uh, a playoff to expand upon. But it just, you know, it, it it's, it's further underscores everything. It, it's not so much the path to power as it is the path to relative stability, which, as you said sure. time and again, stability is the currency, the yeah. ultimate currency in 2024 college football, because the Big 12 added, I don't even know how many teams, like 18 teams now, whatever it is, right. 16 teams, and they're getting less money 
as part of this agreement than anybody else, but they are one of the power four conferences. They will clearly be part of this playoff. My assumption is on most years, they'll get more than one team in. Right. That is a, that is a win if you're Brett Yormark, even if the money doesn't quite stack up to the Big Ten and the SEC, which are getting, by estimates here, on average, like $9 million more per season. Mm-hmm. This is where we are. Uh, the only bit that I will add on a personal level, the commentary, if you, if you go and read like Facebook comments or YouTube comments about this, the commentary around Notre Dame is just killing me. Oh, did it, people, people just, are pissed pe- that Notre Dame has as large a seat at the table as they do. They are. And it's the one, the one tie that binds mm. in college football, this hatred for Notre Dame. And as a Notre Dame fan, these are the things that make me more of a fan, frankly. Yeah. Uh, the fact that people spell Notre Dame with the R before the E or the E before the R because they think it's funny or the R before the T because they like saying Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the discourse out there about Notre Dame having this big a slice of the pie or being included at all because they're not in a conference right. is the one thing we can set our watch by sure in college football if notre dame joins a conference then the whole damn thing's going under because that amount of that amount of pure unadulterated hate in the online <laughs> sphere is one of the only things that i look forward to as a notre dame fan of at course. this point they're not winning the games against ranked opponents they still haven't figured out how to build a passing game right. there's a lot in notre dame world that's great there are a few things that still are there and have never really gotten better this is the one thing that I love. So thank you. Again. Thank you, Internet, for giving me this. Just to, to play devil's advocate to all the Notre Dame haters, they hung with Marshall four straight quarters two years ago. They did. Where were those haters but, then, Ty? Listen, it's a thundering herd, okay? <laughs> it's not just a regular one. Yeah. Um, th- I, I mean, that's why Notre Dame's at the table, right? That's why they have that seat, because they can afford to do this. They know that people will watch their games. They know that people have enough of an opinion of Notre Dame that they're always going to be in the, at the, the table conversationally. And because they're at that table, people are going to tune in to their games out of sheer curiosity to love on them, to hate them, whatever. They've earned it. They've earned it at least over the course of the history of this sport. For whatever reason, people are drawn to the Irish. And that's why it exists. I need... I need to know we'll have we'll have Pete or somebody on Pete Sampson yeah. or somebody on in the relatively near future to talk through Notre Dame and its stance at independence and what the dollar figure looks what the delta looks like mm-hmm. before they decide they they need to join the Big Ten. Yeah. Okay. What does that look like? Because at some point they will have to. At some point they will have no choice. And I don't know if it's based on Florida State leaving the ACC and making that conference basically insolvent. I don't know if it's based on some of the upcoming, let's say, court rulings with respect to whether or not players are employees and if that changes the sport again in a pretty drastic way. I don't know what that tipping point is. But at some point, that dollar figure, that gap between Notre Dame and teams in the Big Ten is going to be so great that they're going to have no choice. I uh, guess. I mean, at I, some point, I don't even know to. if that's true. I, I think there's point. there's something about the freedom that Notre Dame has that is worth an amount of money that isn't necessarily quantifiable, but it allows a certain amount of scheduling flexibility. It allows a certain amount of advertising revenue, TV revenue. I mean, where- look, Dan, this is the system, the way that this is set up. Yeah. And again, we don't know what the format is of the 14 thing. Sure. 14 team thing yet. But the way that the 12 team playoff is set up, we've talked about on the pod, it's it's advantageous for Notre Dame. It doesn't work against them. Right. It really doesn't. So if you're Notre Dame and you're making that calculation, like, okay, we don't play a conference championship game against a better team. We're going to get, in turn, a worse team at home first round of the playoff. That's a trade you make, all things being equal. But if there is a money conversation, if that's money that you can use to, you know, fund whatever, I don't know. I'm not an AD. I'm not an administrator. Sure. Then perhaps it's a different conversation. But that's 
We will ask that question to somebody more informed in the Notre Dame front. Should also mention there are a couple of clauses in this deal for peekins, I think is the the phrase. So, you know, after the first season, I believe there's a peek in to further discuss the competitive nature and financial nature of a 14 team playoff. And also there's a clause if there is some sort of realignment or major realignment that happens then the the players involved let's be clear not the football players no <laughs> the representatives the of major right. conferences and institutions can the guys in like yellow jackets right? yeah yeah they can meet up to discuss the future of the playoff like it's not set in stone there are opportunities to uh to be a little bit flexible with the format should there be realignment as well so they're baking in a number of different interesting uh avenues for change should they want it along the way but so we have 12 teams for 2024 2025 and then starting in 26 so that would be the 2024 regular season begets a 12 team playoff That's same right. for 25 and then starting with the 2026 regular season we go to 14 which honestly at this point the most fascinating element to me is not the like how many big 10 and sec teams get auto bids because we know it's going to be a lot it's more, how are they making this calendar? How are they setting aside the time in December? How deep into January are they willing to go to hold this playoff? Or how early into December? Or what, what becomes of conference championship games? What becomes of the portal dates? What becomes of, and I know, we, I think we've mentioned it just in passing, that like some of the dates around signing day, like I don't, think it, I don't believe it's happening this time. We'll do a, a show about the changing calendar, but like, uh, we could have a, a summer signing day relatively soon, I believe. Like everything is changing in terms of calendar. How are we going to rejigger everything to squeeze in, you know, the round of 14 games or whatever, that first round in yeah. some place in December? What happens with the Bulls aligning with everything? It's, I don't envy the job of whoever's formulating this behind the scenes. No, and you're also talking about players who are going to play 17 games. Correct. Yeah. Players who are going to play 17 games, 12 plus the conference championship. Maybe your team loses, but you still get in. Maybe you win, but you don't get the buy. Suddenly you go the full way through. You're, you're playing 17 games. And on some level, that's a player safety issue. I mean, it was in the NFL. Sure. 14 is going to be exactly like the NFL with the way that they've expanded their, their playoff with the super wild card weekend. And they expanded to 14 teams as well a couple of years ago. And so on some level, there's a conversation here about if we do get to a point with college football where we're calling players employees, even in the current state with NIL, where players can use leverage if they want to. We haven't seen a whole lot of it, but there, you know, there's certainly been opportunities out there. If, if players who are ripe for the NFL and ready to go on to the next level, look at the playoff system and say, wow, this is, hmm, I don't know. I don't know if I want to put myself through four more games. Those are conversations that I think we're going to have more of Even the thing progresses. The red shirt conversation around like you get the four games um, and then we've had an ability to watch red shirt players in bowl games. So is there going to be a, a player who plays six, seven, eight games or something like that? in a season but technically it didn't happen in yeah. terms of their red shirt year i i can't wait i can't it's it's so screwy and say what you will about the four team model it was and you can argue about the selection process you can argue about a number of elements of it in terms of schedule in terms of bracket pretty clean no yeah. pretty clean way of going about a postseason i haven't been a big fan of it overall it's just been kind of janky to me but i look forward to all of the four team hipsters that this sport is about to breed <laughs> in like 2033 ah oh, the good old days when i could just watch darren lee tackle you know thomas tyner or something early on oh in the God. four team era um it's uh it's gonna we're, we're going to get a bunch of four team hipsters out of this, which is truly astonishing. Four team hipsters. That's a perfect segue. That's what I do. That's a perfect segue to get into the meteor portion of this episode where we talk a little bit about some of that 14 era. Before we do, though, again, hit follow if you want to help support the show. We appreciate that. Also, 
chime in on social media, chime in via email, solidverbal at gmail.com. Really, wherever it is you're consuming this, whatever means you are comfortable with, let us know what your thoughts are in this 14-teamer. We've been, we've been, I think, very interested. We always are, but let's say even more interested to get the pulse of the verbalerhood on this one, because after years of college football sort of being rooted in one philosophy, suddenly things have changed very drastically. And that is when you get very interesting opinions yes. from folks who have followed this sport their entire lives, people who live in, and die by the sport the way Dan and I do. Uh, we, we just welcome any and all feedback. So however you can hit us up, let us know your thoughts. We've had people send in their own formats and their own formulas and their own conspiracies. We read all of that stuff. We can't respond to all of it, but we, we certainly do appreciate it. So however you are comfortable, reach out and uh, give us your thoughts. On the topic of the 14-teamer, Dan. The slipper still fits! It is March Madness week here. Yeah. Oregon's in the tournament, an 11 seed, right? Pack the final Pac-12 men's basketball champions. Yes. Taking on South Carolina. Are you going to pick a bracket? You're going to pick a bracket. Of course right? I am. Yes. You have to pick a bracket. We have, I started the pool. So if you're a, a Patreon or baller, you can play in the pool. Um, I'll make sure that that gets posted for people who are interested. Um, have not looked at the bracket, have not watched any college basketball this year, but of course I'll be picking a bracket and being in multiple money pools. That's just the way I roll. You haven't watched it. I've, I've watched a lot of Caitlin Clark. That's been real fun. I haven't, I haven't watched a minute of college basketball this year. Oh, too bad. A single you. minute. I've okay. seen some of the controversy about court storming and players getting like, right, right, right. Knocked over and some of the Jay Billis takes, but beyond that, I am, I am relatively uninformed. As Purdue is good, years. and they've got a big, tall guy named Zach. Zach, that's Eadie. what I yeah, can tell you. I don't know. Yeah, and they lost last year, I believe. Well, Big Ten teams always lose in the tournament, in embarrassing yeah, yeah. fashion that first weekend. Yeah. So, um, I play the Gus Johnson sound. I'll play it again. The slipper still fits. Thank you. One of the all-time great clips during tourney time from our man Gus Johnson. We went back through time. And we looked at some of those moments over the four-team era that bring us the warm fuzzies. Yeah, of course. Sense of nostalgia. Some of these moments that I guess are going to be gone into the hourglass of time and um, gone through the sands of time. I don't know. Whatever. Some of those moments throughout the course of the four-team era that um, we look back on fondly. Now yeah. as we're expanding this thing to 14. Yeah, we've got, I, I don't know if we're dealing this with this on in like a, a one shining or a bunch of shining moments uh, level or a high school yearbook superlative type level. But looking back on the last, so it would have been what, 10, 14 playoffs? Yeah. Is my math yeah. correct? I hope yep, it yep, is. Yep. You got it. Um, a bunch of stuff that I, I forgot about, a bunch of performances that I would love to to rebathe in the jacuzzi of like there's a mm. there's been a lot of excellence throughout the years a lot of names where you're just like i remember that guy then you like go back and watch the highlights of jk dobbins against clemson right or like jk dobbins and trevor trevor if you travis etn on the same field like there's there's so much and there's obviously look there's a lot of ohio state there's a lot of clemson there's a lot of alabama but the individual performances the weird plays the streaks like there was a lot, there's a lot of meat on that bone that I think we can now in turn as four team hipsters, um, <laughs> we can, we can start gnawing a little bit. Start us off. What are you gnawing on? All right. Who, look, who is the best team of the playoff era? To me, there are a number of quality answers to this. Um, 2021. So the 2021 regular season, Georgia. Most definitely has to be in that conversation. I believe they, of the, the college football playoff national champions, finished with the, the season best net points per drive, which is a, a sort of straightforward metric that I look at. Offensive points per drive minus defensive points allowed per drive. It's like 2.7 net, which is an yeah. insane number. They Obviously, the 2021 team was great. Had a bunch of individual moments, killed a bunch of teams, certainly win a national championship on one of those huge moments with Keely Ringo and the pick six in yep, their yep. Uh, revenge spot against Alabama, who to whom they lost the SEC championship game right before that. Um, you have 2019 LSU, 
I, I was going to say 2019 LSU for me. And uh, I know it is mostly on the back of Joe Burrow in that offense, but sure. the way that they ripped through teams in the playoff yeah. was, I think, pretty notable. They put up 63 on Clemson to win the national championship. They won in resounding fashion over Oklahoma in the semifinals as well. Nobody ever came, well, I should say ever, but nobody came when the rubber really met the road in the sure. playoffs and some of those big games. This was LSU asserting its dominance. And obviously Joe Burrow won the Heisman that year. I, right. That was just such a once in a generation team that for me, it's hard not to put them number one. The vibes are hard to top. If yeah. you look at the actual data, if you look at, you know, the number of NFL players on both sides of the ball, there are interesting cases for other teams like 2021 Georgia, like 2021, 2020 Bama with Mac Jones being extraordinary. Obviously, Devonte Smith being likely the best receiver of the modern era in terms of his casual dominance, Sark calling the plays for that Alabama offense, casually just also walking to a national championship win against, I believe, Ohio State after beating Notre Dame in the uh, in the semi that in 2020. year. Yeah, yeah. And so there is something about that Alabama year, that year's team. And the, the I mean, look, you look at the receivers on the LSU team, it's matched in terms of the, the college performances and bright, shining talent of Alabama. So it's Ruggs, Judy, Devontae Smith, and uh, who am I forgetting? Jalen Waddle. Jalen Waddle. Yeah. Right? So you have superstar power at receiver for both of those teams. Najee Harris in the backfield. Uh, Clyde Edwards. Hilaire. Hilaire. For LSU. Joe Burrow certainly has uh, established himself as an NFL quarterback on a level that Mac Jones has not. Mac Jones is now a backup, I believe, for the Jags in the NFL. The Jag, they got traded. Yeah. At least for a year, he'll be a backup. So Joe Burrow certainly has grown as a name more than Alabama has. And Stetson Bennett, certainly, you know, a, a terrific college quarterback, but hasn't been a factor in the NFL. Um, I kind of limit it to those three teams. And I don't know if there's a team, whether you look at like 2014 Ohio State with the way they finish out the year, but like you compare Cardell Jones against, who was great, was absolutely great, Big Ten Championship, and certainly uh, the Alabama game. Uh, with great Clemson teams, Deshaun Watson, Trevor Lawrence. But in terms of, and this is subjective, electric vibes. I think what LSU did, and I actually, and just in looking at the playoff, do you remember what they did against Oklahoma in the first half of that semi? Yeah, they scored they 50 them. points. They destroyed them. I think it was 49 points in the first half. And when it gets to be that cartoonish, it just resonates with me. So it's obviously a subjective answer. If you're a Georgia fan, if you're a fan of huge defensive football and you say 2021 Georgia, is not losing any of these games. That's fine. Georgia did lose a game, though. Georgia, by the way. Georgia lost to South Carolina in double overtime. There were four big. No, upsets I'm talking about year. 2021. Georgia lost to. Oh, uh, 2021. You're talking lost about, Alabama okay. in the SEC championship. I'm talking game. 2019. Yeah. 2019 was a a big year across the board. Yeah, it wasn't just LSU and the generational season, but uh, Georgia lost the uh, double overtime. South Carolina that was a big deal. Sure. Wisconsin. I don't know if you remember Wisconsin losing as like a 31 point favorite to Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, your Oregon Ducks lost on the road to ASU. Don't remember that and, one. Yep. No, of course not. And number five, Oklahoma lost on the road as a 23 and a half point favorite against, I believe, Kansas State. In yeah. addition to the fact that Skylar this was again. all, yeah. yeah, this was all underpinned by the Alston lawsuit, not to get too gooey with the legalese here. No, you're known for your gooeyness. Continue. But the Alston lawsuit was what paved the way for NIL. It was yeah. built on the back of the Ed O'Bannon lawsuit that had come down, uh, I think, a few years prior to that. But that ultimately sort of changed the way that college football is viewed now. It put us, in a sense, down this path of NIL and the transfer portal and money. And, well, we could talk about that on a separate podcast. 2019, by any measure, was a really momentous year in the sport. But yeah. Real quick, if you like the video, please consider subscribing to the full podcast at solidverbal.com, Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. All the links are down below in the description. For me, it's LSU 1. Um, we've had this conversation before about Michigan in 2023. And a crazy ending, by the way. I mean, that's why Alabama's 2019 squad isn't in this conversation, because they were incredible. They lose a shootout 
to LSU and then they lose to Auburn. Uh, right. Mac Jones at that point had taken over. Tua gets hurt, I believe, against Mississippi State. Mac Jones outperforms Bo Nix when he's completing passes to Alabama players, but he also throws two pick sixes, which ultimately iced the game for Auburn. So yeah, you're right. 2019 was bonkers. It was great. 2019 was bonkers. 2023 was bonkers in a sense too. Sure. And um, Michigan wins 34-13 over number two Washington. The battle of Michigan versus Michael Penix and this crazy run that the Huskies went on with their offense. Primarily their offense, key moments on defense that catapulted them, got them to the national championship game. We, we've had this question before about where Michigan ranks in the pecking order here. Yeah. Um, Michigan, I th- think, was a different kind of team than some of the ones, certainly than 2019 LSU. Yeah. But I think the way that Michigan pulled together and the way that they were able to kind of assert their will on teams should not be forgotten in this conversation. They might not be number one, number two, or number three, but I think they're certainly in the top five here as we look back because of their ability to do, in essence, the same thing over and over again. Teams knew what was coming and they still could not stop it from the Michigan side of things. Never mind the whole Connor Stallions thing. I mean, I know Michigan fans (laughs) don't like to hear us talk about that, and that's fine. Right. But their ability to do the same thing over and over again, seemingly, frustrating the hell out of opponents, was really, really notable in my mind. Like, as a Yankee fan, the way that Mariano Rivera would come in and basically throw one speed. It wasn't always one pitch, but it was one speed the entire time. Mm-hmm. And be dominant. Feel a little bit like that with Michigan this past season. You knew what they were going to do. There were nuances. There were wrinkles here and there. But ultimately, it was, we're going to hand the ball off. We're going to bash your brains in. Mm-hmm. We'll allow J.J. McCarthy to, to you know do some things within this offense. But it's mostly based on what we can do on the ground and playing killer defense. And they did that to great effect. They'd been building for two years prior, and they finally were able to get over the hump this past season. Yeah. That's, I think, an accomplishment. Huge. And watching them kind of go through the, the added elements of, you know, the, the having coaches suspended, like having to deal with this off-field controversy, yeah. the way they pulled together, that, that should not be overlooked as part of this conversation when we're talking about superlatives no i think that the things you hold against michigan aren't fully their fault right the big 10 was kind of hot garbage this year and so just in terms of fun electric vibes you're not getting that from michigan it's not like their team was built for that anyway but the big 10 was terrible the schedule was largely terrible um and michigan did not get lucky they won these games but they played against a a probable non-NFL quarterback at Alabama, which is a rare feat, right? To to have at, at this point in Alabama's uh, time that to have a guy to, to beat a, a, an Alabama quarterback who's likely not going to be an NFL starter, a starter at any point. Um, and then uh, a Washington team, which had a national championship caliber offense, but not defense. And Michigan can't control who they play. I, I think Michigan as a unit, would hang with the very best of this list, Georgia. And oh, yeah. you hold it a little bit against them because they did play uh, a playoff Georgia team and didn't belong on the same field relatively recently. Um, not that their the roster was exactly the same. Every, every year is its own little ecosystem, its own living, breathing thing. But we did see matchups with like what Michigan wanted to do with Jim Harbaugh and some of these assistant coaches against the best of the SEC wasn't always pretty. So you don't knock the 2023 team for that, but it sort of enters into your brain a little bit if you're saying, how would the 2023 team compare against 2021 Georgia? Or how would the 2023 team compare against 2019 LSU or 2020 Alabama? You're like, hmm. They compared favorably against Washington in this year's Alabama. But I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm still a little bit miffed that they lost TCU. For, for as good as the TCU story was right. in the 2022 season, mm-hmm. TCU did not belong on the same field as Georgia. In 65 to 7 game. final score. They lost yeah. by 58 points. I remember we were doing the live stream during that. 
and we were out of stuff to talk about <laughs> pretty early on in that game. I yeah. felt horribly for, well, not horribly, but I felt for Chris Fowler and Kirk Herbstreet and anyone doing an on-air live broadcast for millions of people because there just was not much to talk about. It happened pretty quickly, too. Yeah. And it happened quick. It was a flash fry. It was just over before it started. I'm a little disappointed that we didn't get to see the Georgia-Michigan matchup because I remember in the build-up to that game, or in the build-up to the playoff games, a lot of our commentary centered around the fact that both Georgia and Michigan played a very similar style. And right. it would be, they were 1-2 going into that playoff. It would have been very, very intriguing to see how Georgia and Michigan would have matched up compared to one another. I think it would have been a much, much different game than what we ended up seeing in the championship. All due credit to Georgia, they were the number one team in the country for a reason. They, they won that game going away. But um, I'm, I'm a little disappointed we didn't get to see Michigan in that matchup. Right. I, another team I would put in this conversation, and I'm still going to go with 2019 LSU just because of the electric vibes, um, which is the name of a dad band I'm actually putting out. The electric vibes were very bad. Um, poor song selection, out of tune, you name it. 2018 Clemson. So 2018 Clemson wins a national championship going away. I know this because I watched it from a hospital bed when my wife accidentally ate walnuts and had an allergic reaction <laughs> during the national championship that I watched on an happens, iPad. Happens to the 44 best to 16. Too. Game is yeah. basically never in doubt. Uh, this was the best defense in the country. Clemson had a Brent Venables defense. It was a top 10 offense. Trevor Lawrence as a freshman. Travis Etienne. I believe this is Justin Ross. T. Higgins, if I'm getting my years correct. Like they have winter wonders at receiver. It was almost the reason why we coined that term winter wonders that like yeah. Clemson's receivers. I mean, maybe Amari Rogers on this team, if memory serves uh, post Jordan Leggett, perhaps, but like these guys where you're just like, you only have so many DBs and Clemson just has this like unlimited armory of receivers. And, uh, that seemed to be such a difference maker when these guys were going up and making plays. Mike Williams in this era of Clemson. Um, and they were just bodying Alabama DBs left and right. And obviously Clemson has the history with Alabama in these national championship games going yeah. back and forth and yeah. what, 15 and 16 teams. Um, but yeah, the 2018 team, especially when you look at like where the defensive line was, the, the amount of experience up front for Clemson, like, it it might be easy, and I'll speak for myself, only easy for me to sort of overlook Clemson now because of how they've fallen off these past few years. But those teams were death. Those were they those were, teams they were, were so really good. good up front. Really good up front. Yeah. And you know, you you call out sort of the seesaw between Alabama and Clemson the first couple years of the playoff, right? So 2015, that so the very first one was the Cardale Jones game. That was Ohio State, Oregon. Um, I believe I was with you. I was in your presence after you got back from this game. Yeah, I went to this one with Spencer Hall. Yeah, I was. I was there. We Jerry did. A, we did a post show at yeah in in Texas. But mm -hmm. beyond that, um, the seesaw between Alabama and Clemson from 2015 through 2016, 2017, 2018, we had a good little stretch there where these teams were going back and forth. Outside of those four games, most of the championship games that we've seen have not been particularly close. No. Even the one in 2018, the Trevor Lawrence game that you mentioned when he was a true freshman and came in after starting the year behind Kelly Bryant, Clemson won that game 44-16 over Alabama. We did have a nice little stretch there, though. 2015, Alabama wins 45-40 over number one Clemson. 2016, number two Clemson gets revenge over Alabama. 35 31. 2017, Alabama over Georgia. Yeah. 26 Tua, 23. Yeah. That was the Tua game where he came in at halftime. That was an overtime game. Um, outside of like a nice little run there, most of these championship games have not been particularly close. No. Which is interesting. Uh, agree. Um, so, in my best looking superlative, I have 2019 LSU, 2020 Bama, 2018 Georgia. 2020 or 2018 Clemson, 2021 Georgia, and I have it down here, Bo Scarborough just in general. Because I remembered him <laughs> looking absolutely jacked, went back and looked it up, was correct. Yeah. So best looking just in general. That would have been the 2016 Alabama uh yeah. win over Washington. He had a huge run uh 
Alabama holds Washington to, I think, just seven points. Jake Browning was beat up, I think, heading into that game and just didn't have the arm. But the Washington defense was great that year. Um, so that's I think that was the year where I said, I don't see a loss on this schedule. They did lose to Sam Darnold in USC, but they did right. drop 70 on Oregon in a winning effort that's right. in Autzen. Uh, right. With Jake Browning pointing to an Oregon player as he ran in a touchdown, one of the touchdowns, ultimately one of the pieces that got Mark Helfrich fired um, and Oregon right. hiring Willie Taggart for a year. Willie Taggart for um, a year. But yeah, that was uh, that was my Bo Scarborough reference that I wanted to to get in there. What about worst? I don't. I, I want to say worst teams because these are all playoff teams. So I yeah. like worst looking for playoff performances, playoff teams, whatever. Mm. I have down here. Okay. Oregon's linebackers against Ohio State. Zeke Elliott, by the way, rushed for nearly 500 yards against Alabama and Oregon on that 2014, right? The, the Brent Musburger through the heart of the South, whatever it was, 72 yards through the heart of the South. Um, I have Florida State quitting against Oregon and losing that game by 40. That yeah. was the Jameis Winston slip, fumble. Tony Washington runs it 60 yards back. I was in the stadium for that. That was great. Um, I have... Uh, the Big Ten slash Michigan State slash Midwest, if you include Notre Dame streak, and I calculated the days. It was 1,811 days between Midwestern touchdowns in the college football playoffs. So that would have been the final touchdown scored by Ohio State against Oregon until I think Ohio State lost 29-23 against Clemson 2021. Um, I'll get the year wrong. It's okay. Um, and then. 2,181 days between Big Ten slash Midwestern wins, playoff wins between Ohio State, I believe, beating Clemson in a semi and Ohio State beating, uh, beating Oregon in the national championship. So Notre Dame loses 30 to 3 to Clemson. 30 to 3, and I believe 31 14 to Alabama. So they Correct. had two playoff appearances and scored 17 points. Right. So they scored points, yes. Um, and then. Michigan State, thirty-eight nothing against yeah. Alabama. Um, that is the first playoff, I believe. That was a very first. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, sorry, second playoff. Alabama second beats playoff. Ohio State, and then see, these are it, we're very dumb people. Um, thirty-eight nothing. That year's Michigan State team, really good team. It was a really really good team. They beat Iowa State 16-13 in the Big Ten championship game. That's a Connor Cook Michigan State team probably was in a position to lose to Purdue, probably should have lost to Oregon, but they make it there kind of behind, um, well, not kind of behind, an impressive win against Ohio State in which Ohio State decided not to give the ball to Zeke Elliott, if you remember that, 17-13 loss, um, where Zeke got 12 touches, I want to say. So Michigan State gets in there and they score precisely zero points. I think Michigan State's a team I thought of first yeah. when you mentioned this. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, to their credit, that was a very good Michigan State team, as you said, but they yeah. did sort of run into a bit of a buzzsaw, right? I mean, they're playing against Alabama. That Alabama team won the championship. Clemson was also in the mix there. It was right in the throes of this Clemson Alabama rivalry of sorts. Mm -hmm. And there were a bunch of teams that sort of got thrown. <laughs> thrown to the side amid that. Oklahoma is one of them. You mentioned Michigan State, Washington. We could throw Washington in there, even Ohio State to some extent. Teams that Notre Dame, right? Teams that were also vying to try and get their moment in the sun, but just couldn't because yeah. Alabama, Clemson were going through their their heydays. Um, what else jumped out to you? I You went back through all of these. Yeah. And uh, Bo Scarborough maybe is a good example, but you know, I, I looked through just to try and get context for where some of these seasons were interesting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, it culminates with the national championship. But I find moments like 2017, Iowa put up 55 on Ohio State. Yeah. Can you that imagine keep if, them out? If, yeah. Iowa, if Iowa put up 55 on Ohio State in 2024, what People that, would assume that, it would be women's basketball. <laughs> I mean... How far we've fallen as an offensive unit. Yeah, that, and, and their offense I don't think was even that great that year. You can go back and look up the scores. I think it was sort of like a weird, every, like just the stars aligned on a random Saturday with Nate Stanley and Iowa. But yeah, that helped to keep out a very good 
Ohio State team out. They so they I believe they started that year. That was they lose to Oklahoma with, as we remember, Baker Mayfield does what at the end of that game? Plants a big old flag at midfield in Columbus. So it's tough to lose. I mean, look, Oklahoma was a playoff team that year. We haven't even mentioned that Oklahoma that season probably pay, played in, depending on your preference for game style, the most memorable college football playoff game we've had in the Georgia, Oklahoma, Rose Bowl semi just at an absolute shootout that Georgia somehow comes away with a win. Unthinkable for Georgia to play in that kind of game now, but yeah. Yeah. a crazy entertaining game. Oklahoma looked certainly much better in the first half. Uh, Georgia has the great running backs. It's a Jake Fromm Georgia team. That's uh, right. He leads them yeah. to the national championship very early on in his career. But uh, no, that was it was a crazy game. I remember watching that with, I think I was watching it with, our friend Bill Barnwell in Brooklyn, and it was just a stunner of a TV show. Couldn't have asked for more, um, mostly because I wasn't rooting for either team. I just wanted entertaining football. So yeah, that was that's probably the single greatest performance by two teams in a game to me, just because of the back and forth nature. Not by defenses, but by the back and forth nature. By the way, that we have had to have like a, a Mike Stoops conversation <laughs> about the four team era that he was like heavily involved, like his. His footprints, his handprints, whatever, his fingerprints are heavily on the four team era is not a great look for the four team no. era. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, one other thing that jumps out to me in looking back, and this yeah. is because I'm a homer, mm -hmm. I'll admit it. Penn State not getting into the playoff despite winning the Big Ten title. Yeah. So this is 2016. In, this is a 2016 season. So this is the year where they, they had sort of the, their own version of the kick six and knocked off. Ohio State at Beaver Stadium. Right. Then they ripped off nine straight wins. They won the Big Ten title game. Saquon Barkley on Penn State. Trace McSorley. I mean, this is in the the Joe Moorhead era of Nittany Lions. Huge football. comeback against Wisconsin, right? In the Big Ten championship game. Huge comeback. I was at my friend's apartment. We were screaming, pissing off the upstairs neighbor. Mm -hmm. I mean, though those were the days for Penn State football when they had Saquon and they were kind of going through it. And um, I, I always wanted to see what that team could have done in the playoffs. Of course, I'm a Penn State grad, so it's easier for me to say. But they lose. Um, Ohio, St Ohio State got in. They lost to Clemson that year. Clemson went on to win the title. Clemson beat them 31 nothing. That Killed was them. a shutout game. Killed them. Um, that was also a Penn State team that, one, that's the breakthrough season for James Franklin. Yep. Two, obviously Joe Moorhead. Three, that's when we, I think, coined the term F it, go deep. For yep. Penn State in that game, yep. especially where it was, was it Chris Godwin? Who were the receivers? Deshaun Hamilton yep. for Penn State. Um, and they play in a crazy memorable bowl game against USC in a losing effort shootout in the Rose Bowl. Um, so that's the year before. Again, I'm screwing up my ears, I'm sure. Um, but yes, that was one of the best teams, I think, because uh, I don't think the defense is where it's been these last few years for Penn State, but certainly a, a crazy good entertaining Penn State team they beat Ohio State on a blocked field goal that's right blocked okay. field goal returned yeah in at Penn State in Happy Valley at Penn State yeah in a whiteout situation so that was you know there's there's a bunch of like weird Ohio State moments like oh the 2015 team was great but they lost here um the you know there's a bunch of interesting Ohio State teams that didn't make the playoff because they were flawed in one very specific way um here's what I would do as a a disgusting homer. I would put in the 2023 Oregon team as one of the best teams to not make the playoff. Um, they finished number one in net points per drive, and that's obviously aided by their bowl game against Liberty. But what with what they did to their schedule, losing to Washington the way that they did, they had the, their very specific flaw as well. But I think they are one of the best teams just because ancient quarterback, a full on grown up at quarterback, good. You know, a, a crazy talented offense that scored a ton, a defense that took a major step forward and shut down some interesting offenses. Um, I would put Oregon in that conversation of teams who didn't make the playoff that were worthwhile. Um, as what well, I hear Georgia this year, by the way. Yeah, here here is what I would ask of people who are who are listening to yeah. this because this is a little stream of consciousness. That's right? okay. I mean, we're, that's why we're here. We're that's why we're here. That's why it's the off season, and. That's what these types of conversations are built for. Mm -hmm. If you're not writing in to complain about the 14-team <laughs> playoff uh -huh. 
or give us your thoughts about the 14 team playoff. Write in some way, shape, or form and let us know best team to be left out of the playoff okay. over the last 10 years and best team to take part in the playoff over the last 10 years, right? So really sure. both sides of that spectrum. Are you a 2019 LSU guy or gal? I don't know. Are you into 2023 Michigan? I suspect a segment of our base would probably make that case. Let us know. Best team. I don't want to know your top five. I don't care about your right. top five. I want to know your top team. Top team and top team to get in. Top team to not get in. Solidverbal at gmail.com. You can hit us up on social media. Let us know again um, what your thoughts are on this or the 14 team or whatever your, whatever your argument of choice is. We'd love to hear it. Well, can I give, can show. I rapid fire you and you're just going to pick? Go ahead. All right, here we go. Best performances by a player. OJ mm. Howard going for 200 plus yards, which was basically the same number as like the 10 previous games combined for him against Came out Clemson. of nowhere. Remember that? Yeah. Yes. Out of complete nowhere. That's Jake Coker to OJ Howard for yep. 200 plus yards. Clemson didn't see it coming. You also have a great onside kick um, in a, an Alabama Clemson game. That was incredible. Um, that's a great moment. Uh, Zeke in 2015 for 200 plus against Oregon, basically single-handedly won that game with the Ohio state offensive line. Deshaun Watson in 2016, if you remember being helicopter, just, I think had yep. 70 total. It was like 50 passes and 20 runs, just like willed that team to a national championship. Devonte Smith in 2020 against Ohio state. Yeah, that was ridiculous. Just ridiculous. Um, in terms of like specific moments, uh, the Notre Dame kicker who tied the game at three for Clemson. Before. What am I picking here? Am I picking something? The best moment. Oh, the best moment. Or the best okay. performance. Excuse me. Best performance. Best performance. I, I, Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson. Deshaun, outside of Joe Burrow. Outside of Joe Burrow, who is just a buzzsaw. Right. The whole season through. Okay. Deshaun Watson. I, Deshaun okay. Watson losing a national championship and then coming back the next year and winning a national championship to me, it was a pretty big moment. And it was clear that, I mean, look, we've, we've seen what's going on with Clemson these last couple of years. Mm -hmm. It was clear that within the system that they put forth, you needed to have a superstar quarterback to run that system. You needed to have people around him. You needed to have the defense and all that. You're not going to beat Alabama without those complimentary pieces. But what Deshaun Watson was able to do was pretty damn impressive. Oh, my yeah. Part. So I, I go back to the Watson years as, I guess, 26 to well, 2016 season to me as, as one of those moments um, in college football lore. I agree. I just wanted to offer you one more option. I, I don't think it'll change your mind, but I was going to say the Notre Dame kicker who tied the game at three, mm -hmm. Notre Dame Clemson, before Clemson went on a 27 nothing run Thank to you, win Dan. that game. Do you, you know his name for $5? What was that Notre Dame kicker's name? In what year? Let's call it 2018. I don't know. The Notre Dame kicker. 2019, 2018, somewhere in there. When Notre Dame loses that game, 30 to 3, 31 to 3, whatever it was. But it was 3 all early on. I think it's an Ian Book team. Is that Justin Yu? It's Justin Yu, folks. I owe Ty $5. Give me the money. You can Venmo Your Venmo later. will arrive shortly. Um, I also have best moments, so specific plays or specific parts of games, okay? So you have the Devontae Smith catch to win the national championship, mm. LSU dropping 50 and a half. Um, how about a Christian Wilkins fake punt catch? You remember that? That was pretty that was The pretty Clemson cool. yeah. punter throwing it to a defensive tackle on a fake punt. Uh, and then I've got a pick six to win a national championship for Georgia. I think I think the Keely Ringo moment. Over, over Devontae Smith against... Yeah. Against Georgia cover too. Yeah, because the, the, the thing about Keely Ringo picking that off and, and like it was such a like neck crack moment for yeah. Georgia. You know what I mean? And it was such a neck crack moment, frankly, for a lot of college football fans who didn't want to see Alabama win. Right. That I, I, I think that's it for me. Okay. I think that's the moment for me. I could be talked off of that pedestal, but I think that's the one for me. Who was, here's another $5 question. Mm. Who was the first, we'll, we'll end it on this. Who was the first committee number one team? So we're talking about mid-season rankings release and whatever it was, October, November. The very first team to be number one. The very first team to be a college football playoff, temporary number one, not final 
rankings number one. Wow. It's an unusual team. It's a team that has never made the college football playoff. Lightning yeah. in a bottle, 2014. I know all the years blend together. Is that Florida State? It's not Florida State. Florida State did make the playoff that year. They did make the playoff, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, wow. I couldn't tell you. It's an SEC team that has never made the playoff. Lightning in a Bottle 2014, the Mississippi State oh, Bulldogs. Mississippi State. The Dak. Dak Prescott. That was Dak. The wow. first call. college football playoff number one team. Four team era number one team. <sighs> All right. Let's end it on that. Good yeah. question. Good question. Write in. You know how to get in touch with us. Hope you appreciated this stroll down memory lane looking at the four team playoff and some of the superlatives they're in. Hit follow. Hit subscribe wherever it is you get this podcast. That, of course, supports the show more than anything else you could do. Write in. You know how to get in touch with us. We want to get your input on all of this, Dan. Um, Agree. We will talk a little later this week, yeah? Yes, absolutely. In the meantime, for that guy over there, my good friend Dan Rubenstein, for myself, Ty Hildenbrand, thank you for listening to this here Solid Verbal College Football Podcast. We will talk to you all soon. Stay solid. Peace.